Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth ever Highlight Haven interview. My name is Matthew Heiserman, and today we are joined by a very special guest. He is a sports anchor for 7 News Boston. Let me welcome Maury Hirsch Gordon to the show. It's great to have you on. Yeah, great to be here, Matthew. It was uh, good to see you at, at sports broadcasting camps a couple weeks ago now, uh, as we're in late August, and um, you know, happy to happy to be on the show with you. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get right into it. Over the offseason, the Celtics signed star forward Jason Tatum to a five-year $314 million contract. With that being said, the Celtics now have the two highest paid players in the NBA with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Do you think that these contracts are worth it, or could they potentially backfire saying that the Celtics may also need to sign guys like Chris Stapps, Porzingis, and Drew Holiday in the future? Yeah, no, you make a good point there with the amount of money they're spending. But in a market like Boston, you expect to have championship contenders. Jason Tatum is uh, more than worth it. Uh, he's a guy who who is still scratching the surface on what he can accomplish. I'd argue that that he's still reaching his uh, his prime in the NBA. Although I think last year he started to show really what he truly can do uh, in the playoffs, especially. Um, being able to impact the game in in many different ways, even when he wasn't able to to score the ball as efficiently as as he or the Celtics had hoped, but they locked up Drew Holiday for for another four years back in April, and Kristaps Porzingis still has another year left here in town, and and you've got to see uh, how he comes back from his injury, um, but but right now the Celtics are in as good a shape as as any team in the NBA uh, could be right now, and. Uh, they are all all signs forward uh, and pointing to um, pointing to an, another championship next June. Yeah, obviously a great dynamic duo with the reigning MVP of the finals and a MVP candidate in Jason Tatum this upcoming season. And as of right now, the Celtics have the best odds to win the 2025 NBA Finals. While it might be too early to tell. Do you also have the Celtics as your early favorites? Yeah, it's hard not to have them as the favorites, right? They're coming off of a championship in which they were so dominant. Uh, they didn't play one series that took longer than five games, right? From April, May, and June, it was it was five, five, four, five, and they were sixteen and three, which is one of the best postseason records of all time. They bring back the coach, they bring back the executive of the year, they bring back the pretty much entire team outside of. Uh, Svi Mikhailu, who is like the 13th or 14th guy on the team last year. So you're pretty much, you know, quote unquote, running it back. Uh, so right now on paper, the Celtics are the favorite, in my opinion, heading into the season. Obviously, uh, championships don't get don't, don't get played out there on paper. You've got to see how they how they come back and how they uh, do in the season. Right. Uh, Al Horford's going to be have, having to carry the load there early in the year with Kristaps Porzingis' injury. How does Porzingis look in his return, which I think will come in the calendar year of 2025? What seeding do the Celtics get uh, and how maybe that plays a factor in them going to the postseason? But without a doubt now, all those questions about can Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown co-engineer a championship team, they have squashed all those questions. They answered the bell. They did it. And now they'll always be able to draw back on that experience from this past spring and winning a championship as they move forward now with their careers. Yeah, and obviously they have some great bench depth with guys like Peyton Pritchard, Sam Hauser. Speaking of Sam Hauser, he agreed to a four-year, $45 million extension earlier this summer. Hauser was a solid rotational player for the Celtics during their 2024 championship run. What do you think this signing means for Boston? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great just a homegrown story for the Celtics. I mean, this is a kid out of the University of Virginia who was highly productive during his collegiate career, went undrafted. Brad Stevens finds Hauser and wants Hauser to sign with the Celtics. Hauser had a lot of different options across the league, and, and Hauser decides to sign with the Celtics organization, and he goes to Maine, and the Celtics develop him into one of the best three-point shooters, if not the best three-point shooter uh, in the league right now. Uh, so he goes to Maine, he plays a couple of years, then he signs a, a three-year, $6 million deal a couple of years ago and uh, starts to get some playing time in regular season games and then in the postseason a little bit. And and Joe Mazzola uh, has taken a, a big-time liking to Hauser. Hauser's a great teammate in the locker room. 
Um, I actually covered his, his younger brother in high school. So I know the family pretty well, really stand up family, stand up guy. And, uh, he's rewarded with it, with a nice big time contract. And, uh, now he is, you know, one of the, the key pieces off the bench for the Celtics that, that, that just won a championship. So, uh, whether he's the sixth, seventh, eighth man, Joe Mazzulla really likes him. He's proven that he can be much more than just a shooter. Uh, he's got that length and, and a little bit of athleticism that, that if you sleep on him, um, you know, he can, he can guard one of, uh, you know, three positions on the floor at times. And, um, he's rounded himself into a really nice basketball player. Yeah, obviously a fan favorite. And he really shows that underdog story. Now, obviously the Celtics just came off their 2024 championship title and you got to cover the entire journey to get to that point. What was your favorite Celtics moment of the postseason? That's a great question. Um, if winning the championship uh, on your home court and having an opportunity to cover that, right, with the confetti falling from the ceiling and uh, and winning their first title since 2008, if, if, if we uh, put that as the number one, right, which was which is kind of assumed, if I go and – say, hey, what's 1B, right? What's 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 right under that night after they beat the Mavericks in game five? I would have to say um, the couple of days we spent out there in Indianapolis. Uh, Eastern Conference mm-hmm. Finals, the Celtics were down big both games. Al Horford had an amazing game. Uh, he hit seven threes in one of them. Jason Tatum had a near triple-double with no turnovers. If memory serves, it was, uh, I think, I believe it was more than like 35 points, 10 rebounds, eight assists, no turnovers. They they played exceptionally well on the road in the postseason. We knew that, but then to continue to carry that over and then handle business early to be able to get rest, I thought that was that was huge for the team, um, and that was just such a clutch moment um, in a in a entire spring full of clutch moments. Whether it's Peyton Pritchard at the buzzer, whether it's Jalen Brown in Game One of the Eastern Conference Finals, Derek Derek White's near forty point performance in Miami. Uh, you know, this team really stepped up and, and each player really played a key role for the team, whether it was for five minutes in one quarter or whether it was for five straight games or the entire postseason. But I think if I have to narrow it down after uh, covering a championship on the parquet floor inside of TD Garden, it had to have been games three and four of the NBA finals there in Indianapolis. I mean, that crowd was rocking. Uh, it was the first time they were back in a conference final in a long time, a pesky team. And the Celtics, after playing what I would call is, you know, maybe B, B minus games, um, you know, maybe even even like a C type game for their standards, they still found a way to win. And I think that's the mark of a championship team. And they proved it right. Yeah. And you mentioned Peyton Pritchard. If there's one thing you can guarantee from him, especially in this last playoff run, is to come in and get you a half court buzzer beater, which must have been absolutely electric for all the Celtics fans watching. Yeah, it, it, it truly is. And and Peyton Pritchard talked about that um, earlier before some of those big time moments there, especially the one in the NBA finals in the game five clincher. Uh, you know, he said he said something uh, along the lines of like, hey, I don't I love taking those types of shots. A lot of guys in the NBA, you know, they don't want to take those shots at the end of quarters or at the end of shot clocks or games, because if you shoot one of those, call it once a week. Well, that's a lot of shots there that can factor into your shooting total, which brings your percentage down. Peyton Pritchard said, I want to shoot them because there's an opportunity that it goes in. And it seems like he steps up uh, when it really matters most. And he's become this, this special team ace type of player off the bench where, you know, the shot clock's winding down or we're at the end of a quarter or at the end of a half. Joe Mazzola looks right to his direction and says, get in the game. Uh, and even if the other team's expecting it, he still seems to to make it a uh, uh, few times more often than not. And uh, I think it's a it's it's a tribute to him and his confidence. Uh, it's a type of player that that is really needed to be confident uh, in his abilities to get to this stage, and then at this stage worked hard enough to earn a contract, which he signed last year, and then this year really carved out a nice year for himself as as being a spot starter. Uh, in the backcourt, if Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Drew Holiday, Derek White ever ever missed a game, and and a player that that they really relied upon uh, in the postseason, much similar to what we were just talking about about Sam Hauser, he became an indispensable piece for the Celtics this year in their run to the championship. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, moving on from the Celtics, get into some Patriots talk. Last night, the Patriots had their last preseason game against the Washington Commanders. With that being said, the Patriots have yet to announce their official week one starting quarterback between Jacoby Brissett and Drake May. Who would you currently say is the favorite to start? Now, Brissett also did suffer that injury earlier in the game yesterday, and that does play a role in potentially how quickly he can fully recover. Head coach Sherrod Mayo said post game last night, Matthew, that that had it been a regular season game, Jacoby Brissett would have been able to continue mm-hmm. playing. Uh, still not good though that the offensive line gives up a, a free rusher there to 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 land based Jacoby Brissett in the backfield. Um, I believe Jacoby Brissett will be the week one starter, uh, although. Gerard Mayo continues to say, even this morning in his day after press conference, that Drake May has outplayed Jacoby Brissett in live game action. And he has, right? I mean, you could call it a wash in that first game against the Panthers in week one of the preseason. Week two of the preseason, Brissett wasn't good. He threw the pick. Drake May led two scoring drives, ran it in one time there for the touchdown. And then last night, as we saw, he engineered the only touchdown drive of the game. And that one was impressive 88 yards. He, uh, he, he threw for 71 of them and he ran for 17 of them and he executed a couple of long third downs there. So uh, Drake May has outplayed Jacoby Brissett in live game action. He has closed the gap and has done just as good, if not better than Brissett during practice the last, call it 10 days or so. But right now the offensive line is is not in good enough shape to support a rookie quarterback. And we saw when you don't support a rookie quarterback, what that can happen, uh, what can happen to to the, to the rookie and, uh, or a young player. And that's exactly what happened to Mac Jones the last couple of years. Um, First year he was okay. And then years two and years three uh, spiraled out of control. They want to make sure Drake may enters with a reliable offensive line with reliable weapons, with a defense that's ready to compete. And I think right now, week one, all signs are pointing to Jacoby Brissett. But should Brissett get injured during the season, you'll have to see at what point does that injury happen. If it's early on, do they pick up a veteran off the scrap heap? Do they try to keep a Bailey Zappi to buy some time? If the injury to Brissett comes a little bit later in the year and they feel Drake May and the offensive line are ready to do it, call it week four, five, six, seven, kind of somewhere in that October range. Maybe that's another time when when they start him. But, um, you know, there's definitely going to be some rookie quarterback jealousy here in New England when you look at the rest of the league and Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix all getting the opportunity to start. J.J. McCarthy would have had a really good chance to start in Minnesota. Um, that pretty much makes Drake May the only first-round rookie quarterback from last year not to start outside of Michael Penix, who we know when he got drafted, he was going to back up Kirk Cousins because the Falcons had already given him the money. So uh, that's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but but definitely Jacoby Brissett for week one as of now. But at the time of this taping, it's a little bit before 7 o'clock on Monday, August 26th. You know, there's there's still some time for the Patriots to decide, hey, you know what, maybe we do feel Drake May gives us the best chance. Maybe he can protect himself, you know, behind a leaky offensive line, and we'll give him the ball to start week one at Paul Brown Stadium in Cincinnati. Uh, as of though right now, it's looking like all signs are pointing to Jacoby Brissett. Yeah, now let's say Brissett doesn't get injured during the season. Do you still think that there could be a point where the Patriots transition into Drake May in his rookie campaign? I do. Um, I do. I think it should come a little bit later on in the season. I think I really like week 13 against the Colts. I believe it's week 13 because then it's the week 14 bye, and then there's four games left in the season. So that would give him five games. The bye would come after his first game where he'd play his first game against the Colts, and then you'd have a long time to replay the film watch everything back, have as many conversations with whoever he needs to talk to in order to prepare then again for the second game. You'd have virtually two weeks in between games. I think it happens later on in the season, but don't rule it out that it happens early on in the year too, uh, depending on you know, depending on what, what what's happening. If the Patriots are, are say one and five or one and six, you know, maybe they do throw Drake May out there. I will say though, the once they throw Drake May out there, he needs to be the starting quarterback moving forward. So that's why I would lean a little bit later on in the season. 
last five games or so, assuming the Patriots are not in playoff contention. You know, you give him those five games, he goes into the offseason seemingly healthy with some experience, with some game tape to to review, and then he's ready to go by by the spring of next year, and he's your starting quarterback in year two. Yeah, and now, of course, it's early to tell, but I'm sure you've gotten a good look at the Patriots' uh, schedule. And, of course, they struggled last season, but if you had to do an early prediction of what their record, at least a range of what it could potentially look like this year, what would you predict? So I would say anywhere between like one and five wins. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, if things really do go bad uh, and Jacoby Brissett gets hurt and they still don't feel like they should put Drake May in there, I think this team could could rival that 1990 team that, that was the worst team in franchise history at one and 15. Mm-hmm. If everything goes right, the offensive line holds up. Jacoby Brissett doesn't turn the ball over like uh, they're expecting him to. And the offense and the defense, you know, play their roles. I think this team can can be somewhat competitive and it can be a competitive call it five and twelve season. Uh, maybe the high water mark is six or seven, but I'm not willing to go there right now after the game that we were coming off of last night, right? And seeing that where mm. the backups for Washington, a team that picked second in the NFL draft last year, and the backups backup in Washington were just running right through the Patriots offensive line. Their best five there in front of Jacoby Brissett and Drake May last night. All the penalties, all the miscommunication, the bad snaps, the fumbles, um, you know, you name it. Even an offensive lineman stomping on Drake May's shoe and May having to complete a pass, you know, without one shoe on his foot. So coming off of that, because that game is so clear and we're only, we're not even 24 hours since that game. Right now, I've got them in that one to five range. Um, but, you know, we shall see. Patriots have the third uh, third pick in the uh, in the waiver claim order. So they're going to have an opportunity to pick up whether it's, you know, more good wide receivers or offensive linemen or whoever other players they choose to, to bring in to the mix. It could get a little bit better. Um, but the Patriots have the toughest schedule in the NFL. And when you're coming off of a... Uh, season like they had in which they picked third in the NFL draft and they didn't really do much to shore up the offensive line and improve the quarterback play and sign big time free agents. Um, right now you're looking at a, at another long rebuild here in Foxborough. Yeah. And you mentioned that preseason game they had against the commanders last night. Was there a specific player for the Patriots that really impressed you in that game? impressed me last night yeah um let's go with the let's go with the guard the rookie guard fourth round pick Layden Robinson out of Texas A&M for as bad as the offensive line was and he's definitely a part of some miscommunication and and uh some poor play you know he he has continued to progress uh and he's still super young um you know hasn't even played a, a regular season NFL game yet but but in practice and in, in a couple of the preseason games uh, he's really shown that, you know, he can potentially be a piece for the future. You, you've got to see it happen on Sundays and you've got to see it happen consistently on Sundays for for a long time. But uh, if Drake May is kind of the player who we think he could be showing some of those signs, Jalen Polk, the second round wide receiver out of Washington, got a guy like Layden Robinson. You know, those are three really important building blocks for for the team moving forward in an offensive driven league. So uh, last night I would say Layden Robinson um, definitely caught my eye a little bit in a game that uh, was really hard to find too many bright spots for the Patriots. Yeah. Now as a commanders fan, I do have to respect the performance that Trace McSorley had because he put on an absolute show in the fourth quarter. But of course you, you mentioned that they might not have, the best season this year is there a potential breakout candidate that you have that show that might show a lot of progress from perhaps where they were at the start of the season yeah it's a good question matthew i think i think that's the theme here in 2024 it's it's not about wins or losses it's about progress Mm -hmm. from a team perspective from a team building perspective from the front office and then also individually um you take a look at a guy like christian gonzalez who last year you know uh, played very well for those three plus games in his rookie season when he when he uh, when he started there for the Patriots and then due to an injury there week four in Dallas he was unable to finish his rookie season. 
Um, if he can build and become a lockdown type of cornerback for the Patriots, I think that will really help the back end of their defense. Yeah, absolutely. One of the last Patriots questions that I want to ask, we saw a very impressive preseason from quarterback Joe Milton out of the University of Tennessee. He also displayed both great uh, arm strength and uh, athleticism at the NFL Combine. Of course, it may be hard for him to get playing time as he is behind both Drake May, Jacoby Brissett, and per, perhaps Bailey Zappi in the depth charts. Would you expect him to touch the field at all this season? If so, what might it look like? Yeah, I, I would not. I think something would have to go really wrong for Joe Milton to hit the field. I think he's he's more of a project there for the Patriots. Um, if he can turn into a reliable backup quarterback, I think that's that would be a really nice goal for the Patriots uh, to achieve right after drafting a guy in the sixth round. Um, so, so to answer your question bluntly, no, I don't expect Joe Milton to reach the field. Um, however, you never know how guys progress, you know, if he reaches the practice squad and he continues to perform well, and you've got a, a couple of injuries there, maybe late in the year, maybe in a blowout or two, he sees the field. But, um, for right now, I think he still has a lot of work to do to become an NFL caliber, uh, quarterback. Like I talked about on a consistent basis, consistency is one of the biggest things in professional sports in order to do it too. Um, you've got to be consistent day in and day out in order to have and keep your job. So with that being said, um, you know, I think, I think he can definitely wow you with his arm and his, and his athleticism at times, as you mentioned. Um, but I do not see him playing any significant role in the regular season this year. Yeah, we're starting to wrap things up, but I do have one Red Sox question to ask currently in the MLB, the Red Sox are in the playoff hunt. They are third in the NL East behind both the Yankees and the Orioles. Do you expect them to push their way into the playoffs, even with the odds not being in their favor? I don't. I think if you would have asked me a week ago, I would have said, I, I see it. They were coming off of a really nice road trip in which they went to Baltimore and to Houston, to AL pennant contenders, and they went four and three. They went over 500 in those seven games. But then they came home and they got flattened against the Diamondbacks. The starters weren't good again. The offense, which is one of the best in baseball, fell asleep. And the relievers reverted back to what they've been for much of the second half of the season since the All-Star break. So they got swept. And then this afternoon in the first game of the day-night doubleheader, they lost to the, to the Blue Jays. So entering tonight's game, they're five back in the wild card with 32 to play. You'd really have to win 22 you have to go about 22 and 10 down the stretch here in order to win about 88, 89, 90 games to, to kind of get in, into the mix. Um, I, I still think they'll have a puncher's chance, but um, right now they're they're fading right now. They've lost five straight games. And maybe outside of that series when they welcome the Twins late to, late in September here, um, you know, uh, unless they're two back at that point, you know, it would be really hard to see to see the Red Sox do anything substantial. I mean, they're, they're seven games under 500 at home, which is really hard to do. I believe it's the fourth worst record, fourth worst home mm -hmm. record in baseball. And they're 14 and 21 since the all-star break after they entered it uh, at 11 games over. So uh, fourth straight year. Now the Red Sox have been in contention for the wild card there in August and um, three out of four years. Now they've seemingly lost it where, where the team wilts down the stretch Pitchers aren't good enough, offense disappears, and quite frankly, not enough talent for, for a big market Red Sox team. Hoping they can do something big there in the, uh, in the offseason to, to get back to their winning ways, uh, and I think that starts with Juan Soto. Wow. Now, obviously, it will be difficult, but we'll see what ends up happening there. I do have one final question to ask. If there was one piece of advice you could give to an aspiring sports broadcaster like me, what would it be? It would be show up. Um, you, you you only get better in this business by getting in front of athletes and coaches and asking questions, by getting in the studio and working on your craft, by going to games and working on deadline and experiencing uh, what what anchoring and reporting is in live events, um, much like the athletes that, that I cover, the athletes that, that you cover, that you will cover. It's all about reps and it's all about consistency. Again, to, to go back to that word, if you want to be the starting shortstop of the New York Yankees, 
you take 500 ground balls a day, you're 3,500 ground balls better at the end of that first week. And then you continue to compile those, right? And then you're getting better and you're getting a lot better. Thousands of reps better at the end of one month just by doing that. It's no different in broadcasting. If you want to be a writer, you better start a blog. Get a, get a job with, with your local paper. Um, write for your own website. If you want to be a podcaster, do podcasts. If you want to be an anchor, if you want to be a reporter, do stand-ups in front of the mirror in your bathroom at home. Go out to your high school football games on Friday nights and buy a little tripod for your phone and put in a little XLR there in your, in, in your phone and stand there and, and do a quick one to two minutes. The more you do something, the better you get. And the better you get, the more comfortable you get. Um, and, and that's all it is. So, so if you show up and you put the time in, uh, there's nothing that you can't achieve. And, um, that's, that's been one of the biggest reasons why I've gotten to where I've gotten to so far in my career. And, um, it's important that, that once you continue to move up, that you always stay humble and that you always continue to show up because that's how you got there in the first place. And there's a lot of people over my shoulder that would love to be in the position I'm in. So the reason, um, that, that you continue to show up is that you continue to keep your job day in and day out. But, um, if you can show up, show up with a smile on your face, you're a good person. Uh, you're going to be able to go far in this business. Yeah, absolutely. With that being said, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to say to the people watching before we wrap things up? No, I think that's good. Uh, I, I think I've, uh, I've answered all the questions you've given me. And I think, uh, I think we've had a great conversation here again, appreciate you having me on Matthew and it was good to see you at, at the camp, uh, that I spoke at a month ago now and, um, good luck this upcoming school year. I know school's right around the corner for you guys. And it's also the best time for a sports fan, right? Cause we've got full yeah. slate of college football starting on Saturday. We've got pennant races for baseball, hockey and basketball are around the corner NFL starting up in, in less than two weeks. So, uh, this will take us all the way through till, uh, you know, till pretty much, you know, the NBA, NBA playoffs next spring. So um, we've had a little chance here to rest and relax in uh, July and August during the slower part of the sports calendar. And now we're ready to ramp it back up. Yeah. And again, big thanks to Maury Hirsch Gordon for being the eighth ever Highlight Haven interview guest. And as always, we'll see you next time.